States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If you could please call the roll. Mr. Flasbob? Here. Mrs. Hildebrand? Here. Mrs. Hoskins? Here. Mr. Bob Jones? Mr. Tony Jones? Here. Mrs. Shock? Here. And student representative? Here. Thank you. And if you could please call the calendar. Monday, December 24th, 2018 from Monday, January 1st, 2019 is the holiday recess and schools are closed. Monday, December 24th and Tuesday, December 25th, offices are closed. Monday, January 1st, 2019, offices are closed. And Tuesday, January 15th, 2019, there's a school committee business meeting. Thank you. Um, before we get started, I want to apologize for my voice. I have a horrible cold, and I don't usually uh, speak this low. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I apologize if I have uh, some cough drops in my mouth so that I don't keep cough. Um, but um, our first item on our agenda uh, is a presentation regarding the 2019-2020 uh, program of studies at the high school. Uh, Dr. Vinny, sure. Sorry. Um, <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> so um, this time of year we come to the committee uh, not necessarily looking for a vote tonight unless you would like to, but um, to uh, inform you of what we have in mind for uh, programmatic changes to the program, to the program of studies at the high school. And um, you have, uh, I, I sent to you a list of the changes and I also sent to you a, a copy of what the program looks like. And, Good evening. So um, you'll notice on the first thing of page six, in the former program of studies, the current one this year, we had intended to align the Spanish one and the science programs, if possible, like we did with the algebra one, so that those courses could get credit or be transcripted at the high school. Um, with the Spanish one, with the schedule, we met and determined that they weren't able to do the full curriculum with the Spanish one at the middle school level, level at this time. And so we did not align that. The science was further complicated because we've added some courses to the freshman level. So there are three different entry points now for science. There's the Success Academy with the environmental science, earth and physical science for students who are not in the robotics and engineering CTE, and physics for engineering for the students that are in the CTE. So trying to find one course and keep it equitable for students who would be transcripted and those who would not. If you're in a CT in eighth grade and you had that credit uh, on your transcript, you would end up repeating essentially the freshman year course anyway and the other students would move ahead. We just, in addition to aligning the curriculum, we just didn't see any way at this point to make it equitable for all students. So we've put that in abeyance for now. Um, also on page six, we uh, currently, the Department of Education requires 0.5 credits in technology, but they don't specify what that top technology is. And our students are required to take emerging technologies. It's one course that all students were, were required to take. We looked at our um, course of studies and saw that we have very many rich technology-based courses and we thought we would allow the students to take advantage of some of those courses instead of having to take emerging technologies. Emerging tech is a wonderful course, but some students might prefer to do something else. So we now have 12 courses that would qualify for that .5 credit to fulfill the technology requirement. Um, on page eight, we update just some housekeeping things because the move from Park to RICAS with the Commissioner Seals for Literacy and Numeracy and some reformatting. We decided to take out the reference to Johnson and Wales for the early enrollment program because we don't promote other schools that might an allow that. So um, to be fair, we only really discuss the public schools. And then if a student wants to enroll in a private school, they can always approach us and meet with the guidance counselor and myself to discuss that. On page 14, uh, the change in advanced placement summer work. We formerly had a, a placement rule and if, stu if students didn't turn in their summer work for AP by a certain date and time, then they were removed from the class. That was because we usually have a waiting list. We have more kids wanting to take AP than we could allow to take AP. 
And so the kids who were on the waiting list would then have an opportunity to get into the class. What we found this past year was that even after we let kids from the waiting list in, we still had room in some of the classes. And we thought, why not let students into the class if we have room? So we changed it a little bit to say that it still applies. If, you don't, if you're in the originally in the class and you don't get your work in on time and someone in the wait list does get their work in on time, then they're going to have preference over you. But if there's still room after that process plays out, we can readmit students who submitted work, but it was late. Students who don't submit the work still aren't eligible for the course. Um, page 16, under the um, section with athletics and co-curricular eligibility, we found that the first progress update was a bit too soon. It comes shortly after, sometimes even just a few weeks after the original report card that made the student ineligible is published. And there are so few grades in the grade book at that time, there was a great variability in the grade books and, and the scores. We didn't think it was a rely reliable enough indicator that students were now passing or on solid ground in a course. So um, after a meeting, we determined that we're taking out that first <coughs> quarter, the first progress update for the eligibility um, and making it for this next quarter marking. Page 17, elimination of the weighted, unweighted calculations. It only affected kids up through class of 2019, <coughs> so that was no longer in effect. Now, page 23, we added our new CTE programs, so we were really happy to be able to do that. Page 32. So this current year, we had a new opportunity for students and British literature honors to take EEP credit at Rhode Island College. The problem was we only had one teacher who was approved to teach the course, so he had to teach all of the British literature courses um, at the honors level. And the other teachers in the English department that were t used to teaching junior English said, we really missed the opportunity to teach those students. So we decided to combine their wish with the wish that we had had students saying for a number of years that they wish they had another option besides British literature. Some students love British, British literature, some do not. So we developed a new course for world literature and that will be available to students in the junior year. So now the options are world literature at all levels, SA, CP, and honors. British Lit Honors will stay at the honors level because it's concurrent enrollment. And we have the AP English Language and Composition. So now the juniors have a lot of options that year. And page 59, the addition of Spanish 1 and 2 course to help uh, with the students in the 8th grade Spanish. So in that meeting we had where we discussed the transcripting of the 8th grade Spanish 1 and determined that it couldn't be aligned, we saw that um, students weren't going to have a full Spanish 1 course. Therefore, it would be unlikely that students were entering Spanish 2 in their freshman year. So in order to help alleviate that situation, we have a combined Spanish 1-2 course. It will be accelerated so students can catch up. It's almost like Spanish 1 and a half. So whatever they didn't cover in the Spanish year in eighth grade, they'll be able to catch up and finish the Spanish 1 in that first year and then cover the Spanish 2 material. So um, it won't disadvantage the students who were talented in the world language in eighth grade and just didn't have the opportunity for the full curriculum. Dr. Ishii just wanted to comment on that. Yes. So uh, uh, you're finished. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Nope. No? That's okay. okay. So I just, uh, I know this is, this presentation is Mr. Jones' favorite part of the school. <laughs> <laughs> he's here. I feel terrible that he's not here. But he did talk to me uh, yesterday, and he has um, two items that he would like us to look into. Uh, one, um, he would like us to come back to the committee in January and let you know our thoughts on um, having seniors um, mandatory for six classes. Right now, they have to take seven classes. As, as you know, in the last few years, we've gone to an eight-period schedule. There are a number of students that are taking more than the required coursework in the first place. But for seniors, um, we notice there are other high schools that uh, mandate for seniors to take six, and then they would have to pass five to, to be eligible for sports. Um, mm -hmm. So that could be an option for us. We'll come back to you and let you know 
you know, um, what that what we think that would mean. Okay, we still have time in January to do that. And also, he, he knows there's an interest out there, not only from him, but um, from, uh, and I've heard this from members of the town council too, about having um, a mandatory course in financial literacy. So uh, we similar to like the democracy, similar to the democracy. That's going to take us a little longer. So uh, he he agreed that this would be kind of a year long conversation and something to kind of uh, task us with for right now and come back to you with here's what it would mean because if someone's taking something, it means they're not taking something else. Um, but we have opened up the schedule quite a bit to go to eight periods, um, and you know there. You know, we just talked about the elimination of the technology of that particular course anyway mm -hmm. as, as a mandate. So there is more flexibility being built in every year for the last few years. Um, so that would be part of it. And one of the things I realized I, as I was skinning, skimming this, skipped over, because of the double dipping that is now allowed on coursework, we're in, for the class of 23, we're reducing to 23 credits. So the double dipping means that if a student is taking something that's math related, for instance, they're in physics, which is math related, it could count for that fourth math related course at the same time it's counting for their science course. So although they only get one credit for the course, it checks off two boxes on their graduation checklist. So that will also, that kind of um, doubling up will allow students more flexibility in their schedule. And for the six credits for senior year, we say they have to take seven courses or seven credits, but that doesn't mean they're always taking it in the school building. We have a lot of students who are taking courses at local colleges. They're enrolled in dual enrollment or quality ACN courses, and we try not to have students overload. So sometimes st students have an off roll. The seniors are allowed an off roll period because they're taking a night course at URI or CCRI, so they come in later in the day and their schoolwork is extended later into the evening try to get that balance. So seven credits doesn't always mean on campus. One more thing I wanted to add. Appendix A is going to be eliminated before we upload it. Appendix A was having to do with the career and technical at another school. So that will be taken out. Any other questions? I have one quick question. Mm -hmm. So the emerging technology change it says beginning of the class of 2023, so that means the students that are there right now still have to take that emergency. Right, most yeah. students take it when they're freshmen. Yeah. yeah. Right. There are very few students, only a few CTE students who couldn't fit it in their freshman year, yeah. and we actually are working with a few students who are in that case, but um, it would, almost everybody takes it freshman year, so. Okay, so it's okay. Yeah. Just one, one quick question, and I think I brought this thought up before, but as the choices get more complicated, you know, there's the ACN and dual enrollment and off-campus, on-campus, should it be six, should it be nine, should it be mm -hmm. eight, should it be four, do they get, will there be any opportunity for increased one-on-one -on -one time with their guidance counselors to help them figure out what they should take? Because it's so much more complicated than it used to be, and I know there's right. limited resources, but I think without that guidance, most kids who are not self-driven enough or know exactly what they want to do might miss an opportunity because there's no one to tell them or to, to recommend it to them. You know, and I know everyone does the best they can, but. Our guidance counselors actually meet one-on-one -on -one with every student. No, I know that every they spring, do, but so, I'm wondering. Yeah, so some students might need a little more time for these choices. Yeah, so just if but, there's a way to have them, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what the answer yeah, is. Yeah, I, the, I think they do a terrific job trying to spend quality time with each student. And if there's a student who, in, in that short time that they have to meet, that 15 minutes or so that they have, says, I think I need more information about this, I'm, I'm sure we can right. have the guidance counselors do a follow-up with them. Okay. Any other okay, thank you very much. Right, for the thank you. And the so uh, next on our agenda is a presentation regarding the uh, 2018 RICAS. <clears throat> Thank you. I know there's been a lot of information in the newspaper already, so some, some of this may be quite familiar, 
um, to you, even though this is a brand new test for us. This follows the three years of park testing that we had. The park testing included um, uh, right through to the high school. Uh, this test that was administered in the spring of last year, around April, um, was uh, administered to grades three through eight. So RICAS, it, RICAS is the Massachusetts test. Uh, it is the exact test. It was purchased by, by the Rhode Island Department of Ed, uh, and the name was just changed, but it is exactly the same test. It is the same learning standards that we have been using. So sometimes when we, when we change state assessments, it's because there's been a change in the standards. Um, this is not the case this time. We're still basing everything on the Common Core standards. That has not changed, so that's good. Another advantage to going to this test was that it's less testing time, which we were looking for um, and have been looking for um, just to, to avoid test fatigue and over testing the students. It does take away from instructional time. And the other advantage or one of the rationales for going to this test was that now we have a direct uh, comparison to Massachusetts. And why that is important is because it is the nation's highest performing state for public education. Wasn't always the case, but around 20 years ago, things started to uh, shift there. No direct correlation to me leaving Massachusetts as an educator and coming to. <laughs> yeah, it was the two of us. There you go. That explains everything. <laughs> Okay, so as I mentioned, this test was administered to grades three and eight. It's in two content areas, um, ELA, which is English Language Arts. Some people confuse that with ELL because that's another acronym that is um, tossed about and used in the uh, education speak. Um, and so uh, the change was, as I said before, that we are not administering this in the high school any longer. Uh, now we have the SAT, which counts in the accountability for the assessment for the high school. Um, that has worked well. The students are more motivated they, um, because they use the SAT test results, so they take, they take the test very seriously. Uh, and so um, we think it's a change in the right direction for lots of reasons. So we can't compare the RICAS results to PARC directly, obviously. Um, even PARC, PARC had five levels to it. The RICAS has four levels of scoring levels. Um, and they're two different tests entire, entirely. Though based on the same standards, you'll see a lot of um, commonalities with the test questions. Um, however, they are different tests. There is um, uh, more rigor with the um, uh, RICAS test, so we cannot, um, we cannot directly compare them. However, um, they, Wright has come up with a system to be able to show growth from the POC, uh, the latest POC test in 2017 to the RICAS test in 2018. So this is uh, overall, when the state presented this to us, uh, one of the things they mentioned was that in both ELA and math and across all grades, fewer students were proficient than in previous years. So a lot has been said about this, and it's gotten a lot of publicity. Um, what, what we're feeling or in what the state is feeling is that students, uh, it doesn't mean that students are learning any less this year than they were learning the year before, just that the expectations are higher. So the cu cut points uh, for certain things are higher. Um, I was talking with a math coach today, our elementary math coach, and um, we were actually talking about last year in the POC test, um, there were many questions where students got partial credits for answers, whereas it seems at, at least initially in our analysis, it looks like there are a lot of one-point questions uh, in the RICAS, and so you either get it or you don't, and there's no partial um, answers to anything. That doesn't explain everything, um, but that, it's something that we just noticed today. And then there was 98% participation in grades 3 to 8 across the state. Um, North Kingstown, we were about 99.3% participation. So that also is a, is a change from a few years ago. As you remember, the participation was a struggle um, regarding opting out, et cetera. So that has shifted. 
And the, the overall summaries, uh, so for ELA, Rhode Island was 34%, in Massachusetts, 51%. And then um, we in North Kingstown were 54%. So we are about 20% higher um, than the state average. And for, ironically, it's the exact same for math for us compared to Rhode Island. Uh, Massachusetts uh, math was around 46%. Actually, that number, um, I just corrected it and sent it for the uh, Publication 12 webpage um, tomorrow. That's, I noticed that's an error. It's actually 48%. They stayed level from last year to this year. Rhode Island elementary schools performed higher than middle schools, um, and that was the case with us, too, um, well, except for one of our middle schools. Rhode Island grade three was highest in ELA and math. We also had a very strong cohort in grade three. Um, some people would look at that and say, hmm, I wonder, does that mean that the uh, test, there was something about grade three testing? Uh, you know, maybe it was something they related to, et cetera. We're not sure. Um, and Rhode Island grade three was low, a uh, grade seven was lowest in the ELA. And we also had that trend in one of our middle schools. So, we're, we were very relieved and very happy. I, you know, I know that when the RICAS results came out, overall the uh, achievement um, uh, proficiencies are not great. Um, however, relative to the state, we're doing about as good as we have in the past. So you know, we had some, I know I had personally, I won't speak for Dr. Oje, but I had fears that with this new RICAS test that we might really plummet um, in relation to the other districts. And, um, and we held our own. So sixth highest district in the state for K to A dis districts uh, in ELA and fifth highest in the state uh, for math. Uh, I went back and I looked at the park, um, but as Dr. Oje and I were talking about the other day, you really, you really can't compare it because, you know, we're missing the high school again. So when we compared before, we used to compare K to 12 districts. Now we're just comparing K to 8 districts. And the uh, third highest in the state um, for ELA and math for our SATs. So that's uh, a real, really great achievement for our high school. So our school level distinctions, our Wickford Middle School was the second highest performing middle school in both ELA and math in the state. So that, uh, that is non-charter school and, and um, that's counting uh, public schools. Same for Hamilton Elementary School, third highest performing in ELA and the second highest in math. So that's quite an achievement. And then, as I said, the high school, we say fourth highest in ELA and, and math, um, but third highest in the district. Um, it's because if you take a, a district like Providence, they had classical. So classical outperformed um, uh, uh, our high school, but as a district, Providence did not outperform us. And so we have the comparison. Um, the, this is just shows uh, basically the 20% difference between the uh, um, district and the state. And proficiency, just so, so that everybody um, is reminded, this is it, students who achieved a three or a four. Okay, so pocket was a four and a five. So this comes directly from a briefing that we had from Ride in their presentation. And you, what you're looking at here on the left side of the um, vertical red line, you see three um, years of POC, um, POC results for Rhode Island. Um, that's what the blue and the yellow is on the left. And then um, in the middle, you see um, to the left of the, of the um, red line, you see last year's uh, Matt, um, uh, MCAS compared with this year, so to the right of the red line, um, 2018 MCAS. And then below that are the Rhode Island um, assessments for 2018, so the RICAS. Is that, is that clear to everyone? Okay, so I just want to make sure. So th this right here, um, so here we're looking at Rhode Island, and we have three, uh, three years of data for the POC test. Then last year when we were administering the POC, um, Massachusetts was doing their MCAS, and then the new, new generation MCAS, as a matter of fact. And then this year, um, this is 2018 um, results 
for, for Massachusetts, and this is Rhode Island. The right cast. So there you see the um, f four levels. So we have um, the not meeting expectation, partially meeting expectations, meeting expectations, and exceeding expectations. So those numbers stay the same for both ELA and math, those, these cutoffs. Um, this, these are for the scaled scores. <clears throat> and they stay the same for every grade level, too. That was not the case when we had NECAP going back. It used to shift for each grade, so it can, it can be a little bit confusing. Here we have proficiency by grade. This is for ELA, and this is the, the first column is just a reference to the state. Um, and so you see that our grades one, uh, grades three, excuse me, three, four, and five, uh, pretty high and pretty strong in ELA. Little decline for us in grade six, and a little decline for us in grade seven. Once again, matching what's happened in the state there. What did not happen in the state um, is the eighth grade. We really went up it, um, there very strong. Um, and you'll see a comparison in this slide. You can see what the state is doing. So you can see the grades three, four, and five for the state, that's in green. Uh, then down a little bit with grade six, similar to us if you see our, our trend going down. And then in grade seven, um, a real plummet for the state, not so much for us. One of our middle schools had a real strong um, showing in seventh grade, so that helped that to bring that up. And then eighth grade, um, you know, eighth grade uh, for the state from seventh to eighth did not go that high, four percentage points. But for us, we went up from uh, 45 in seventh grade to uh, 60. Yeah, I mean the comparison between the two. So that's pretty high. This is those full levels, performance levels that I pointed out. This is um, the percentage of students in each of those levels. So the lowest level is in the orange. Then the next is, the, is green, all the way to the highest in gray. So what we're, what we're looking for is, is smaller amounts in the orange and bigger amounts in the yellow and, and um, gray uh, in, in this slide. And so you see with the state, you see the orange on the state is uh, the percentage is um, higher, you, you can tell. For math, we had a strong cohort with um, grade three, again, a little bit dip in grade five that we're looking at, and then um, pretty strong with sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Not as strong as grade three, though. And then in comparison to, uh, to the state, the state was pretty much level from uh, grade four on, a little dip in eighth grade. Um, our eighth grade was very strong. This is another area where we can't do a comparison to, to the park in that respect because um, when we did the park test, uh, students took an algebra, eighth, most eighth grade students um, had either took a regular general eighth grade math which is basically what this is, um, or they took an Algebra one, And so most of our strong um, eighth grade students, our higher performing um, eighth grade students in math took the Algebra one, And so the regular math scores were extremely <clears throat> low because those are students who struggle a little bit with math. This is a combination of, it's all of the eighth grade. So that's why uh, it, looks, it looks pretty strong. Do you have a question about that, Greg? No. Me, no. no. no okay. <clears throat> and then this is the breakout of uh, the four levels again. And we've got, um, for us, for grade three, you see uh, in the gray, that's, that's looking pretty nice there. So um, I think the students are really getting, we've been focusing a lot on conceptual understanding. Uh, and I think it's, it's starting to show. This is a breakout by subgroups. So here you'll see, a, um, a, a, this is a comparison with the state and with us, but it's also a comparison for like homeless and non-homeless. So you can see both populations. Um, one of the biggest uh, disparities is between male and female for ELA. We have a, a large disparity, not as, uh, well, so the state has as well. Uh, and another thing that I want to point out here is 
Um, our English language learners did not do well in, um, in this test. This is, a, this is an English language arts test. And so you see no data there, no yellow for us at all. And that is because um, we had over 95% of our students not achieving proficiency on, on, on this ELA test. So, however, if you look at the last column, it's ELL, English language learners who have exited either their first year, they've been exited for one year, two years, or three years, and we, so they've exited our program right here in North Kingstown, and 50% of them have met proficiency. So that reflects on, on a successful program. And then you'll see in, mass, in uh, mathematics, uh, you'll see, first of all, for the gender, the uh, males and females are similar in their performance for math. We don't have that, what we had with the ELA. In both, I have to point out, in both ELA and math, uh, we had very poor, poor performance with our children with disabilities, um, as did the state. So it's an area of weakness. Um, this test was very rigorous, and uh, we just have to work on being able to close that gap. The question, if, what, uh, what puts a student in that category, an IEP or? or? Yes. Okay. And then the English language learners did better, 10% proficiency um, in uh, math. So they, uh, sometimes math it, um, is a little bit easier for, for them to comprehend rather than, you know, the, obviously the English language proficiency is, is the area that they need to grow in when they, when they come to us. And um, then you see that they went up but not as dramatically, up to 36% uh, once they have exited the program. I wasn't going to include this because we do have a couple of categories where we don't even have representation in these subgroups. As you can see, um, the Pacific Islander and the American Indian. Um, but we do have representation in the others, so I decided to put it, uh, put it back in. And, um, you know, it's obvious that there are, uh, our subgroups are performing um, much, much, uh, much, much less proficient than our white population. And this is by in math uh, performance overall even lower. I've got to say though, um, our end numbers uh, on these percentages are, are pretty low. So the conclusions um, this came from what the sh with the what the state shared with us. <clears throat> In ELA, females are more likely by half to be meeting expectations than males. <coughs> Fewer than one out of 20 students receiving special education support are meeting expectations in both ELA and math. Students who have been exited from EL support services are more likely to meet expectations than students currently in the programs. That's pretty self-evident. Students who are not in low-income household are two times more likely in ELA and three times more likely in mathematics to meet expectations than students who are in low-income household, and we have seen that. White students are more than twice as likely to meet expectations than Hispanic, Black, or American Indian students. I'd like to just leave this up forever, and this is a wonderful data, makes us smile. Do you agree? A lot of hard work at the high school, um, a, a lot of work with um, uh, lining the SAT and providing supports through the Khan Academy, uh, revamping curriculum. Uh, a lot has been going on even uh, for the last, uh, last few years. Um, so it has really paid off. You can see huge, huge gains there. I mean, double uh, the proficiency in the state. Dr. Hammer, um, those scores, what is proficient for the two tests? what SAT score correlates to proficiency? Well, it's a three for the college board, right? Is proficiency if they get a three? Right, they, they use the three, one, two, three, four system. Okay. So they, they took they everything that was a three and a four. It, how does it relate to? Isn't an SAT score like, you know, 650 or, yeah? Right, they, they do bands. They do cut bands. They do bands, okay. Right. You don't know where that cutoff is no. between a three it's, and a four, okay. Yeah, they, once they get the results, then they Sorry, actually, two and a three is. Right. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, but the other day, I noticed that Ride put in a, in a very good um, PowerPoint on their website with all of the uh, PSAT, PSAT, and SAT 
um, information. Um, so it was very detailed. So it's, it'll be a good resource. I just got to go through it um, recently. So the RICAST um, reports, individual student reports, came to us uh, Monday during our admin council meeting, actually, and we were able to distribute them on to all the schools, and they are going to be either mailing them or backpacking them to, um, to families, and that will be on Thursday. Tomorrow, I will be sending out an email message to all of the parents with that information, so they'll be looking for... Uh, the individual report. It's pretty detailed. It has the four levels on the top, and then the, it shows the student in comparison to the uh, to their school, to the district, and to the state. It also has um, areas. It, it actually has um, the points that the student scored in in domain areas, and then on the bottom, the actual item numbers and how many points the students um, scored in, in there. It's not easy for the parents to know what those items are at this point because they're not all released. Only a handful of the items have been released uh, publicly, um, but they did provide it. And then they also have the student growth percentile. As I said before, it's hard to compare the two tests. Uh, Ride explained to us that they felt that one of the main questions parents would have was, well, did my student improve from last mm -hmm. year? And so they felt that they needed to um, do an SGP, which is a growth percentile. And what basically this is doing, the SGP measures the student's learning um, to their academic peers. And what that means is students who scored the same, the same or close to the same um, scale score on last year's PARC, then they take those students and see how those students um, did, performed on the RICAS, and the uh, student percentile, um, the SGP, uh, say the student had an 80, it means that the student performed better than 80% of their academic peers. So the advantage to that is that some people will say, well, um, you, you know, my, my student is a, a very accelerated learner. Or so you hear sometimes um, uh, a classroom teacher might say, you know, I can't get the scores to go higher because I have um, a very acceler a, a, a large group of accelerated students, and it's hard for them to get any higher. Or you have people who say the opposite. We have students who are struggling, and it's hard to get them to to do any better, um, to show improvement. This this particular method compares students to students who actually performed the same way. So when you're measuring them, you're measuring them stu students with like performance. That's why they're called an academic peer. So um, I think it's a it's a fair way to um, to look at it. And we do use um, uh, we do use growth percentiles in our star data and for our um, when when our teachers and our administrators write their SLO, their student learning objectives each year, their goals for academic performance, we do use that um, in SGP because we feel that it's a, a better measure or more accurate measure. Usually an SGP is done with a, within a same test. It's not usually used for two different tests. And um, also it's usually based on the median um, of where that student fell or where the class fell median-wise. Um, this is not the case with, with this particular situation we're in this year. They're using um, average scores. So I did provide for you um, the growth scores which are the average scores on the, you see a bar graph, first of all, of the growth for the district, and then underneath that is, um, I went through, we have an actual model, and you have access to it on the website too. It has all bubbles on it, and you can hover over, and you can get the school, the school's achievement, their growth, um, their poverty level, all of that. Um, so I made a little chart just so you have a quick reference for that. So we have the data portal. More and more information is becoming available to us. Even the, the growth um, information, we're getting more and more of that. Um, we're also getting uh, the released items. So w all the schools right now are starting to dig into their data. Some of them have already incorporated it into their um, RTI uh, meetings. I was at a, a school the other day right after this came out, and um, they went through every category of students, every level of performance, and 
pulled up the list of students and um, actually looked at what they used for tools during the test, uh, how many items they missed, um, you know, which items were the ones were, that were missed. So taking it right down to that level and then creating a plan uh, based on that, moving some students around to some fluid groups to give some intervention support. And in the school, this particular school that I was in, also um, creating fluid groups for kids who accelerated um, so that they can be challenged by doing, you know, some other activities that um, um, you know they would find challenging. So we are uh, in the thick of it all right now, uh, doing our own real strong item analysis. You know, Ride had provided a lot of that item by item last year to us with the park, but um, that is not available right now nor is the historical data for the teachers. So when a teacher goes into this system, they see their current students, um, but they don't see their last year's students. So there just wasn't capacity at Ride to provide that kind of data um, to us at this point. But this is the first year, so things will, um, you know, I'm sure, will improve as this test is administered. Um, and we are sticking with it. Um, that is the message. Um, and so um, Dr. Auger is going to follow up with some of his Thank you, Dr. Summary. Um, I just wanted to point out, you know, um, and, and this is going to reiterate a lot of what Dr. Humber said. I, I'm, I'm happy that in Rhode Island we are adopting uh, essentially the MCAS test. It's a, it's a very successful model, the most successful in the country. And, um, you know, Massachusetts has had 20 years of preparation. I remember when I was teaching at Attleboro and I was involved in a summer MCAS camp with my high school students there. Um, and that was um, 1999. So it's been a while. Um, and so there's been a lot of preparation there. And um, so, you know, I'm, I'm also encouraged by the fact that, uh, you know, this is the third state assessment Rhode Island has in five years. And the fourth in about 10 or 11 years. So, um, and every time North Kingstown has gone to a different assessment, uh, year one, the, there's a lot of learning about what's in the assessment. It's a rough year. We've always had year two and year three using growth. And so I'm very encouraged by our staff and their ability to you know, look over the results, learn from them, make adjustments. So I'm confident that's going to continue to happen here. Um, I'm happy uh, that we're, uh, you know, so high compared to the rest of the state. Uh, pretty much consistent with where we were uh, in the last few years, so that's good. Uh, I take, um, you know, I, I uh, congratulate the high school for the third place on the SAT, but I think that congratulations goes to everybody in the district. You know, the, all of our kids are going to that point, and, um, and I think that's a really uh, good and positive sign for us because, you know, that is a, a well-established benchmark test uh, nationally, internationally taken. And to, um, to know that we're in the highest of company in Rhode Island on that test, I think is a good sign all the way around. Uh, the comparison with Massachusetts communities shows us uh, that we have work to do. Obviously, uh, they don't live all that far away from us, and we're very comparable in a lot of ways to communities that are scoring significantly higher than we are, even though we're, we're in trying for Rhode Island. So, you know, we need to learn from them. Um, you know, the, the information around certain subgroups, particularly special education, not just in NK, but all over the state, is, is very alarming, you know, and, and that's something that we really need to be focusing on in NK as well. And so, you know, um, I'm dedicated, and I know uh, that everyone, our principals, Dr. Humbert, our, our teachers, our whole staff, you know, we're looking at this, we're going to learn from it, and we're going to find ways to continue to improve as we have with the other assessments that we have. So, thank you for your presentation. Yeah, right. Any questions on presentation? Thank you very much. Um, you know, as always, there's good and bad, and, and uh, I want to commend you for the work you've done on uh, the areas we're doing well, and obviously you know, we'll continue to work on, <coughs> excuse me, uh, addressing the issues that we, uh, you know, need to spend some time on. Thank you. Um, so next item. A couple of recognitions. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so recognitions.
So first recognition is we want to congratulate NK's Dylan Foria, who was named <coughs> the 2018 Rhode Island Gatorade Player of the Year. And um, Grace Helig um, has a winning design that was printed on all NK reusable bags, and the regs go into effect to January 1. And so is that um, nice that one of our students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. Congratulations to I her. Was, I was going to be mentioned to Dylan Boria, but I'm glad you took care of it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Stole my thunder. All right. So we're good with the recognition. Okay. Um, so next item on the agenda is citizens' comments. Um, I have one person who signed up, uh, Michael Dare. If you could come to the microphone, sure. please state your name and address, uh, and we ask if you could please limit your comments to three minutes. Okay. Uh, my name is <laughs> Michael Durr. My address is 202 Brookside Drive. Uh, the reason I'm here is because um, we have a second grader at Quinesset, and Mr. Jones and Dr. Auger both are familiar with <laughs> with my concerns about this. Um, the recent test results will show you that that school is alarmingly underperforming. Um, we've, we've communicated about this. The only thing that my wife and I can see that would lead us to believe that there's a difference between Quinesa and the rest of the schools in the district is the uh, the percentage of low-income students who attend there compared to the rest of the schools in the district is about 65 percent FRL students as you call them um, in the in the school compared to Hamilton which I believe has around 18 percent or so or maybe even less um, and we feel that the, the reason why you're seeing the test scores at that school at Quinesic compared to the test scores at Hamilton so different could be the reason, could be the lack of diversity in Hamilton and the, and the lack of diversity at uh, Quinesic. And we just feel that um, Quinesic is being set up to fail uh, at 65%. Uh, Dr. Humbert in her presentation showed you that I think it was, I wrote it down here somewhere, um, only 28% of low-income students are proficient in ELA, ELA and 20% are proficient in math. So when you put the majority of the kids that are, are performing at that level in one school, <laughs> you're creating a, an unfair learning environment. And I really you know, urge you to, to look into that. I know there's no easy answer. Uh, Mr. Jones and I have been going back and forth through email about this. It's a complicated issue, but, <clears throat> you know, I don't think that any of you would choose to send your children to, to Quinesset over any other school in this district, given those numbers. You know, it's, it's a real problem. <laughs> we've, we've been there, this is our third year. Every year we've been advised to switch her out. She's a high-performing student. The other highest performing student in her kindergarten class transferred out, and the other highest student in her first grade class transferred out. So that should tell you something. That school's not going to succeed the way it is. So I would ask you to do what you can to create a more diverse environment there and in the rest of the schools in the district. That's the way you want it. You want to have this, the same percentage of proficient students and the same, the same percentage of ELA students and, 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 you know, I think you would see much even, much more, uh, uh, a better majority of students succeeding in Quinesset if you even the numbers. And that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Yeah. Anyone else who'd like to speak who did not sign up? <clears throat> Next item uh, on our agenda are routine items. I could have a motion to seal the executive session minutes of December 11, 2018. Mm -hmm. A motion from Ms. Tony Jones. Okay. A second from Ms. Hoskins. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Passes unanimously. Many no's. Passes unanimously. <laughs> Um, I can disclose that no votes were taken in our executive session this evening. Um, for our consent agenda, um, anyone have any items they would like to exempt? 
I'm going to exempt E1. Yeah, I was going to say, which one was that E1, right? E1. Any others? <clears throat> and I ask for a motion to approve the non-exempted consent agenda items. Motion to approve all the non-exempted consent items. Motion from Mr. Robert Jones. Second. Second from Ms. Hildebrand. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Um, so I exempted uh, E1 <coughs> because I need to, uh, I've been given the name of the individual for the 1.0 full-time uh, I just level. have to back up. Yep, sorry. I'm sorry, I should have exempted because I wasn't here on December 13th. Okay. December 13th, so I need to abstain. All right, so then uh, let's see. So we uh, we can unanimously. Oh, yeah, I wasn't All right, so let's. Uh, so I will make a motion to rescind the vote we just made, and if we're all unanimous on that, we're okay. So I have a motion to rescind the vote we just made. Second. I have a second from Ms. Hoskins. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That passes unanimously. We're going to rewind. So we will exempt item C1 and 2, correct? Okay. So we're exempting C1, 2, and E1, and then we'll do a do-over. I could have a motion to approve the non-exempted consent agenda items. Sorry. Motion, Ms. Hoskins. Second. Second, Mr. Tony Jones. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Um, I will make a yep. motion to approve items C1 and C2. <laughs> and I'll second that. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Extension from Ms. Hildebrand and Ms. Hoskins. Okay. <coughs> now, <coughs> on to E1. Um, uh, the reason I exempted that is to give the name of the individual. So Sarah Brayton is the person for the one-time, well, sorry, 1.0 full-time equivalent science position at DMS. Um, so that's who we would be approving. I'll make a motion to approve item E1. Second. Second from Mr. Tony Jones. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> passes unanimously. For unfinished business, um, uh, Mrs. King, I think, would speak to the uh, Meritorious Budget Award in 2018-19 school budget. Yes, so I'm uh, proud to announce that for the fourth year in a row, the North Kingstown School Department has been awarded the ASBO International Meritorious Budget Award for Excellency in Financial Reporting and, and Transparency. Um, this award was, is really for our controller, who's done much more than the, the, he's done all of the work on this. He's done an excellent job. Four or five years ago, he came to me and asked me uh, if I would mind if he submitted for this award. The regulations and the rules of what needs to be in the document are this long. Uh, the document itself is nearly 500 pages long, but it gives a really, really good historical um, perspective, <clears throat> not just for the school department, but for the town as well, because ASBO requires that there's town information in there as well. So you've got tax rates and, and historical town information and census information. So it's a phenomenal document. We're very, very proud of it. I think it's a, a real testament to the school department's commitment to transparency, to financial excellence, um, and I think that the school department has come a long way in the last 10 years with this kind of data. Um, I know that we have um, our wonderful reporter here, uh, Jacob, and I'm going to make sure that he receives a copy of this press release because I would really like to see snippets of this put in his next article. Um, and of course we will... Um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> We will uh, also just mention this on uh, Monday night, but I think the whole town should be proud of this. I know that, that Dr. Ajay and I certainly are. Thank you to Steve Janelle again for his really, really hard work on all of this. And how many years in a row is that? Four. Four. Yeah, so the first year that we submitted, um, did we didn't we thought, ah, it's the first year, you know, there'll be a lot of comments, you know, kind of a trial year. We have been awarded for since the first submittal. So Four submittals, four awards. Excellent. We're very proud. And I'd like to say, you know, uh, I jokingly emailed you that you know we would expect nothing less, I and mean, we kind of take it for granted that we've uh, you know, been successful in getting this every year. But it, it doesn't diminish by any means the, the work that's gone into it. And, and thank you. And, uh, 
school. And that's the other pertinent question <coughs> is how many other districts in Ohio received are, this award? There are none at this time. Um, many years ago, uh, Warwick or West Warwick, um, but I mean many years ago. Um, so no one has uh, submitted, to my knowledge. Um, it's very, it's very labor intensive. Um, you know, I, I think that the subsequent years are a little bit easier, but um, our controller has made changes to make the document look different, and he learns something every single year that he wants to change. He's, he's starting on the FY20 submittal already. That's the way he is. You know, we're, we're really lucky to have him. But right now, there are no other, no other districts in Rhode Island that have received this award for a lot of years. Thank you. Um, and then on the 2019-2020 school budget? No. CIP existing bond and future bond? No. Um, in your packets are disposal notifications as well as the financial reports. Does anyone have any questions on those? Yeah, where did you guys find a VHS player? <laughs> <laughs> and you don't, don't want, want to keep it? <laughs> I have one at home. You would be amazed at the stuff that's been squirreled away everywhere. And I'm sure this one has been used to the end. <laughs> Uh, then, uh, if there are no further questions, we've reached the end of our agenda. I'd ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. I have a motion from Ms. Hopkins. Uh, second. Second, Ms. Hildebrand. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everybody.